Welcome to the Warren Cycling Podcast. My name is Dean Warren. I'm in Amsterdam today. And I'm Randy Warren, and I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. Well, this is the week before, well, the, the few days before the start of the Giro d'Italia, the first grand tour of the 2021 cycling season. And it's kind of interesting because all the other ones last year were crammed into a short time period in the fall. And so it doesn't seem like it's been that long, I guess, since since the Grand Tour. And it hasn't hasn't been. But this is going to be, uh, you know, a chance to have the maybe the normal schedule back in place. Whereas there are still some races, though, that are a little bit out of kilter. But this one is one that we're used to having in May now, right? Yeah, yeah. And actually, too, it's interesting because last year's edition seemed a little different because we had people battling out for the pink jersey at the end who we don't normally think of as Grand Tour contenders. Oh, yeah, for sure. Jai Hindley, I was just seeing the article about him. Um, not maybe as prepared the way he'd like to be and hoping he can still put in a good effort. And I, don't, I didn't really even consider, oh, he could be a contender because, I mean, he was on the podium last year, but... And then I don't in the really, pink for a long time. Yeah, Zhao Almeida was in the pink for the longest time. Jai Hindley just had it for like a day. One day, yeah. Yeah, but Zhao Almeida, I don't think about him as much of a contender either. And then Tal Gegenhardt, who won last year, he's he's not even racing. No, he's going to do the tour to so, support Garen Thomas. Yeah. I don't know. It seems like Simon Yates has got the best form right now, and he he was in the driver's seat of the Giro a few years ago, and then... Um, spectacularly uh, dropped. Had a bad day. Yeah, had a bad day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I had a, I mean, but he was just like flying in that, that race. So. Yeah, he had uh, won two stages at least. Uh, aggressively too, just like really yeah. like he was on fire and then he just burned up. So Yeah, it, it, we, we don't know what shape Egan Bernal's in. No, but you would think no big question is, mark there. If his back is not hurting him, you'd have to think he is the out and out favorite, I, I would think, if, if yeah. his back's not bothering him. Yeah, I mean Ineos the, with that you know team, uh, but you know I, when I think of Ineos, I think of last year's um, Tal Gegenhart winning, and I watched this uh, Tour Romandy that just took place, and man, what a coup in a way it was for Ineos to get Rohan Dennis on their team, because he is so instrumental in in that Giro win last year and this Tour Romandy win, to have someone of his caliber to be able to work at the front so high up into the mountains as he can yeah. just I mean, phenomenal there's, there's, i mean he, he's he's like i don't know what well, there was a time, there was a time when they thought he would be like a one week stage racer you know have a chance to win one week stage races so oh, sure yeah, yeah so his, his climbing is good enough to do that kind of you know have that kind of um, result so yeah it's for sure and and, and you know interesting he's you know he says they were kind of lucky to get him in some ways, but it's weird because yeah, <laughs> the, the circumstances around him and his personality yeah. and just uh, and Enos is normally a real controlling type team too. Yeah, but they got all the money of the best stuff. I think he was complaining about not having equipment that was as good as what he wanted. I think, don't you think that was part of it? it was, yeah, I think I don't know if it was good or bad. This wasn't what he wanted, so. And it's just in his mind. Yeah. Well, I was, think a lot of these teams, you know, they they have the sponsors of equipment that's very important for the team, but may not be their favorite piece of equipment if they've been on other ones and, and they're you know not as happy, but they're stuck with it. Yeah. And so when he left, you know, Baham Rita, right? So, yes. so yeah. And then he, he rode as you know, for Australia for the time trial where he won. He was on a BMC right. locked out, locked out from, BMC. Right. Yeah. From his, from his old you know BMC team. So, um, yeah, I think though Inos for them, for him, they kind of made an exception. There's, you know, most of the riders they're a little more strict in terms of how they fit into the team. And I think for him, they said, "You're a potential world champion again. You know, just kind of do what you want to do, and we'll support you." And he, and he likes that. <laughs> oh yeah, but he pays them back so much yeah. with the what he can do in, in the race. I mean, he in that. Well, I guess we'll talk about the Tour of Romandy some too, of course, in this podcast, but. Um, the state, the mount, the first mountain stage, really the, the climbing it was stage, well, the second stage, cause they had prologue stage one, Sagan one and the sprint and that, that next stage, a lot of climbs, a lot of climbs. And he pretty much kept the pace up to thwart any, any kind of breakaway and just kind of kept it to, 
bring a larger group normal that would go because it wasn't not a mountaintop finish to bring it into a sprint finish and that's where Sonny Cobrelli benefited by yeah. being the last fast guy who could hang on to that pace up the, that the Rohan Dennis was was setting to keep it all the race all together yeah and they said that Cabrelli went really deep that day to be able to put himself in a chance to win because he was second the day before to Sagan um, so then the next day he was out and Sagan was still there, but then the break ended up winning the day. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it, it was, again, it's, it's like, how do those things work out? Sagan set up the second stage and didn't contest the sprint. You know, it wasn't even in that group. And then he did contest the next day. So Cabrelli actually made the better move because he dug deep to make that last, right. that last move and, and, and was the fastest guy, like you said, but then the next day paid for it, but it didn't matter anyway, because the break went the next day. Right. Well, Mark Solar. He, he was right. more or less a break. I mean, he was he, he won so a, a, a late stage attack, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't say, the break didn't stay Not off. Really but he, right. He, he attacked on the last climb in horrendous conditions and and held it off. So yeah. So yeah, I almost feel like I'm I'm we're, I'm caught between now. We're talking a little more about the Giro and <laughs> what's going on, but also what happened to Tour Romandy. Cycling News had such an in depth article. <laughs> About every stage, and, and they played it out. They the the way it was written was like a like a very detailed, um, uh, almost like a story <laughs> of how the riders were feeling and and just how the bad the conditions were and how how it all played out. And they used it like a redemptive kind of theme where riders who had you know had had difficulties and other times you know redeemed themselves with wins like Cabrelli not winning on stage two and not having won since last year got his win and also um like garrett thomas, thomas yeah had, had not won since not one either yeah. and crash yeah. and so yeah very very and remy cravania i know we've talked about remy cravania before as a time trial so we talked about how he yeah. you know is a strong breakaway is one solo but he's always like getting second in time trials well he got his win in the time trial this time too so it was it was um you know pretty fascinating race that the the weather definitely was playing a part in it being such oh miserable conditions for the racers but um at the end in the beginning the first couple of stages yeah, it was fr- really nice weather, right it yeah. was threatening rain but it, it held off yeah and so but yeah it just got the last, last bad to worse were, which reminded yeah, me of yeah. my ride today um oh yeah uh, the, yeah I, I wrote you i said yeah i'm gonna be in the amsterdam and but the weather forecast was like 92 percent that's funny weather.com started putting like odd percentages it used to be you know 50 60 percent 70 now it's like 48 72 today was 92 percent chance of rain and uh, wind gusts up to like 50 miles an hour and so not you know but but that's then i kept 50 miles an hour that's like that's damaging yeah, winds for right sure. you're not, you're not yeah i didn't feel you could knock you over and so yeah of course john and i on the ride we talked about the different races where wind has affected riders like blow, blowing um paulini Luca paulini from katusha then and get level got him into the ditch or yeah. or um, Andy Schlett getting blown by the wind on his time trial bike and crashing out his hip and really, really this is a, kind of the beginning of the end of his career, that that injury. So, yeah. wind but wind I digress. Wind. So I'm talking about the the weather here today was, uh, was predicted to be bad, going to rain, and then I saw it had a kind of a window where it was not going to rain. But then I looked later and then the percentage went up again. As we were rolling out, there were a few drops, but it stayed dry for the first hour and seven minutes. I marked it. It was hour and seven minutes. So we had nice conditions, and then, and then it really it was gusting and came down hard. John was saying, "There's like buckets, like someone's throwing a bucket of water on me." <laughs> it was right so hard. So we went through, but we we didn't have the miserable conditions of having to go for hours on end in the rain. It, and and I was saying too, well, once the rain stops, um, with this wind, it's just gonna blow us like we're in a big blow dryer. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, uh, it, here, here we had a lot of rain and wind and lightning and, and possible hail and stuff too, so I chose to ride, ride it inside. I was planning to ride it outside, and I bumped that to tomorrow morning because, yeah, it, 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 it came through today for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was also. leaving Atlanta yesterday, and there was a lot of storm activity. I, I saw, unfortunately, tragically, someone um, lost their life with a, a telephone pole or something getting knocked down on, oh, on wow. his car or something. Yeah, so it was... Yeah, bad bad weather in the southeast, which which can happen in the springtime and even through summer with thunderstorms that build up during the hot time of the year. So, so anyways, uh, going back and forth between Tour Romandie and and uh, uh, the Giro, 
Um, it is the fourth uh, of May, so tomorrow is Cinco de Mayo, and it's episode two forty nine of the Warren Today, Cycling Podcast. And today's May the fourth be with with you. May the fourth be with you. Yeah, and and next week I'm thinking, wow, well, the, the probably the best day to do the podcast would be um, on my schedule on your birthday <laughs> to have two hundred fiftieth on your birthday. So I don't know what your birthday schedule is, but we'll we'll work that out later. That's coming up next week. You're to celebrate your birthday. Um, but uh, the Giro starting this. Uh, Saturday on the 8th of May, so just coming up, and we're looking at the rosters, talk about who we can see as the top contenders, but there's a lot of question marks, like we're saying Egan Bernal is, is back, we're not sure about that, um, Rohan Dennis is not there to support him, so he, he isn't going to do what he did last year, but they've got um, Jonathan Castrejo, Filippo Ghana, which is another story too, he was just flying it from the last year winning the world championship in time trial, winning every time trial. Hey, well, and thought he was like going to be yeah. unbeaten, and now he's been um, beaten several times. So I'm not sure exactly what what his form is, but but we'll, I guess we'll find out in the Giro. Yeah, he was you know eighth or ninth, I think, both in the prologue or the first time trial, and then the the last one too. So super strong still, no question about it, but just not dominating. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see because last year he won both the time trial and a road, a mountain road stage in the in the Giro. So and it, he's uh, he's that kind of Rowan Dennis, you know. You think we talked about it before, right? With if Rowan Dennis and Filippo Gagna rode a two-man time trial, <laughs> it'd be pretty hard to beat by any other two-man squad too, because they're both that yeah, kind of big, huge motor yeah. who can also climb. They could probably meet three or four-man squads the way yeah. they ride. But um, well, yeah, G, G, it was the GCN did that thing where it took five <laughs> guys to beat one guy. So. Yeah. <laughs> Looking down the the rest of the teams, are um, you know, a few teams won't have an overall contender like Azure de Jure Citroen. They have Tony Gallopin going out for stage wins, and hopefully Larry Warboss will get Larry Warboss oh, yeah. will get out and um, get a chance. He's, he's you know, in a breakaway. Definitely stage hunting. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, he had an article I think right about him. Say, yeah. I think I read something he said where he was picked out a number of stages, which he thinks he might be able to get into a break and then have a chance to get a win there. So he's, he's really, yeah, he's, he's feeling good riding really strongly and he thinks this might be a grand tour that he might be able to pick up a stage win. Yeah. He came in hot. I think he said last year. And so as it, as it went on, he was um, a little overcooked. So he's trying to come in maybe a little undercooked this time and build up, keep a strong form throughout the whole three weeks of the race. Uh, Apples and yeah. uh, Phoenix, uh, they have Tim Merlier for us to go for a sprint win, but they'll be stage hunting as well as Androni, um, Giugatoli, Cedar Mech. Um, I, don't, I don't think they have a win yet, do they? So. No, not that I know yes. of. Uh, Simon, Simon Perlaud, he's been active um, recent races, riding well. So, But Astana Premier Tech, now they have... Alexander Vlasov, who I didn't realize he got third in the Welt, didn't he, last year? Yeah, I have to look that up. But he's a strong climber. I mean, at at the beginning of the year, he was up there climbing as well as like Nairo Quintana, it seemed. And we'll have to see. I mean, a three-week race, a lot can happen. But uh, So that's kind of a question mark with him. And then Bahrain Victorious, having Mikel Landa supported by... Pelo Bilbao has been riding really well, as well as Damiano Caruso. Yeah. Um, Mikel Landa, you know, getting really a free, you know, not a free chance, but really having a team fully supporting him is something that he's already wanted. So, um, but still, I, you know, I don't know exactly how, you know, how he's going to fare. So a lot of the question mark there, Bora Hans Grohe, of course, Peter Sagan, and you know, a lot of chances for stage wins, maybe the even the sprinter's jersey. Um, yeah. Emmanuel Bookman, Emmanuel though, Bookman, though yeah, he would be their GC. He yeah, was fourth he, of the I, tour in 2019, so that's what shot him up to being a, a, a contender. But uh, not, you know, still not not sure. Um, Kofid is looking for perhaps Elia Viviani to, um, you know, build on that one win that he had. Um, and then more question marks. Remco Evenpool has a race all year. Coming back no, from his, his, his uh, crash, crash, yeah, and, yeah. yeah, and now he's going to race a Grand Tour, but they're, <laughs> you know, but then they're saying, okay, well, he, he's not really their number one guy is Jao Almeida, who was in the pink for you know most of the race last year, but you know he's just super young too, so you know who knows how he's yeah, going to respond this year. 
I think they really don't know about Evan Poole, but they're hoping no. he'll, he'll do well, but they're not expecting anything from him, I think. Right. And did you, I read it the other day that originally um, they wanted to send him to Hagen's um, Berman action team oh, sure. for a year. But then they oh, were getting so many, there were so many offers coming in that. Um, I missed what you said. I'm sorry. You said you, said you read the other day. Oh, that, that, that they wanted Evan Poole to go to Hagen's Berman action for a year. To get oh. some experience and not have pressure at a racing window, <laughs> that would have been crazy if they he would have been winning a lot of yeah. these races with them. But <laughs> but there was a lot of big offers coming in, and the, and um, back to the favor really wanted to secure him, and he negotiated with his parents there to his contract and and that extension, which is probably which is helping um, Quick Step to keep sponsorship and the team going there. But um, they announced a number of extensions recently. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they must feel pretty confident in their longevity, which you know. Like you said, Patrick Lefebvre has got a long track history of keeping that team going, even when they seem like they're on the rocks. But yeah, they're they're really securing a lot of these top riders. And I heard that they're the most winning. It's 2013, I think. The most winning. Yeah, them. yeah. That's they're always up there in, in number of wins each year. Yeah. Um, looking at EF Education, Nepo, Hugh Carthy. I mean, sure, I think he can ride a good race, but you know, to win the overall, that would be a, a big a big win. Yeah, they have Van Gardner in, in the yeah the, TJ Van Gardner in support. Yeah, and, he's and actually Simon Carr, well Simon too. Carr is going to probably a surprise too. The young Brit rider, British rider, has done, and they got a an Alberto Betio, of course, for other stages that uh, maybe they can get a win somewhere, somewhere for the EF team. But um, Yola Cometa, the team of Ivan Basso and Alberto Contador, I. I really don't know much about you know, who they have on their team, so I'm not going to go well, out and Italian, yeah, yeah. Italian registered team, so that's how they got in. And um, yeah, I think that they they're you're going to be in every break <laughs> during the whole race just to be able to get Probably. the team out there. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't expect any any jerseys or wins out of it but maybe an early jersey they're probably one of the teams that'll be doing everything possible to get a jersey with you know in the first couple of days just to get their you know a rider on the podium but yeah i think overall we expect to see them super active but probably not picking up any stage wins or anything group rama fdj i don't see um any big overall contender for, for their team sebastian reichenbach was active of course as a swiss rider in, in the tour romandy um Rudy Marlard's got the number one twenty one for them. So and then in Marche, Wanti Gobert, um Jan Hirt, he's carrying their number one. But uh they have Taco Vanderhorn. I'd like to see Taco get a win just because his name's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Israel Startup Nation, uh Daniel Martin. Dan, yeah, Dan he'll, Martin, he'll, yeah, he'll 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 rice well, but he's not really a, a guy that I can see being even on the podium, maybe Top yeah, he said that five, he, I saw something 10. recently. He said he's he's riding really well, and he feels like he's really well prepared coming into this race. So, you know, he's always one of those guys that is an outside shot at the podium. I think that outside shot, but I don't yeah. expect it. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised, but I, I don't expect right. it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Jumbo Visma, George Bennett. I mean, he gets to lead the team now. Um, big big chance for him, and he, yeah. he won the Tour of California, yeah. which you know. It's a pretty good race to have on your Palmares, but uh, that's another one I would be surprised to be on the podium, but definitely top five, even top ten for sure. I would hope he would be up there with that team that he has, uh, one of the big budget teams. Uh, Lotus yeah. or Dahl, man, they've, they've well, been... Just real quick back to oh, Gr Grunewagen's... Yeah, Grunewagen. Sure. Oh, yeah. You know, Dylan Grunewagen, that's a good story, too, because um, John, I was talking to John, and he saw a... a show i think it was a show about grunewagen coming back and 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 just the whole ordeal and how heavy it was on him and how really i mean he, he believes sincerely john through seeing him talk that he was not trying to push him in i mean doing anything unusual intentional, intentional yes. and yeah. that it, that it, he suffered a lot greatly for it and he's worried about being back in in the racing too so yeah you know i've I'll give him a pass. I think he deserves, especially another chance, and things yeah, like that, that can happen. And I think he, he's doing what yeah. he can do to make it right. So, or yeah, what I don't he think he was do. malicious at all. I think he no. he was at fault because of the way he sprinted, but it wasn't malicious. It was just the way he was sprinting. And so, he needs to make a couple of corrections to make sure that he's not putting people in the barriers. But, um, yeah, I don't think he is 
yeah. you know, a dirty racer. No, no, not like we can name a couple others yeah. that we won't. But uh, yeah, no, that'll, that'll be interesting. I mean, he was asked like if he's in the front and you know, the sprint, he's going to go for the win. He's like, well, yeah, I'm going to go for the win. But he's not sure how he's, yeah. he's going to re- react to being in that situation. But I think instinct and all that, it'll come back to him. Yeah. Uh, Caleb Ewan should uh, get some wins for Lado Sudal, who has not, I mean, being a Belgian team, you'd expect them to be strong in the spring, in the spring classics, and they really didn't come up with uh, with anything. So, um, I mean, you have Thomas DeCant on their team, those, you know, one <laughs> can win for breakaways anytime, and then Caleb yeah. Ewan sprints, but, but for a team, you know, if you got the two big Belgian teams, Quickstep and Lado Sudal, it's like lot of who, so it's not. not, not they've had a tough spring, yeah. yeah. So and I know Philip Gilbert has not raced as well as you know he he would have liked to this year either too for Lotto. So that's been a little bit of a disappointment, I think, in terms of his finishing. Um, so yeah, they've not had the spring they'd hoped for. Yeah, but Kobe Goosens, uh, he was active, uh, riding really well in the Tour Romandy, out front a couple of days in the breakaway. So maybe he's yeah. going to have a have a good race. So. I would put him on my fantasy team if I had one. I think as a, <laughs> a guy that didn't cost me very many points, that could get get some uh, good points in the in that kind of game. But so movie star now that's that's a good question right there. We were just uh, talking um, about Matteo Jorgensen before we started recording because we we interviewed Matteo not so long ago and he is making his Grand Tour debut. Not much pressure, but he's going to be there supporting Mark Solari. He said he's happy to be in support of Mark and being in this situation where he's not um, going for an overall GC, he can um, not have that pressure to have himself always have to be up every stage towards the front, but can have maybe some stages where he relaxes a little bit and recovers so he can be there to help support Mark Solar, who, who has been riding well. He got a stage win at the Tour of Romandy. But, um, yeah, in really tough conditions. And in, in the end of a race, it made a, made a bold move. So I think that, yeah, he's, peaking at the right time for the Giro, for sure. Yeah, well, it was interesting, though, the, the next day where he put in an attack kind of far out, and he was wearing the leader's jersey. Like, he he wasn't as confident that he might well, be able to keep... I mean, he needed to gain yeah. more time because he didn't time trial anywhere as well as, as Garrett Thomas, who was up yeah. up there. And but I think, I think they whittled down his team, too, a lot, so he was almost more, isolated Almost isolated, anyway. yeah. 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 So I figured if he he think if he attacked, then he might whittle down um, Ineos because they still had a lot of riders there. Yeah, I think so they had four like, riders, I think, still, yeah. Yeah, so I think it was a move where he was hoping to be one-on-one with one of the uh, Ineos riders rather than having to, you know, to work against so many people. It just would have been, you know, just so just trying to make it, you know, more even odds. Yeah, yeah, it didn't work out well for him even to stay on, on the podium <laughs> because of his his time trying and strong guys yeah. behind him but so i mean this is they have you know more time trials in this Giro, so maybe not suiting him as well but uh that's a question mark about him too I, that's like like i said there's a lot of question marks about the rider i mean looking at at simon yates who won the tour alps and looks super good so you yeah. almost i almost think right now that he would to me for me to think about the top guy that's in best form and best chance to win I would have to put him right at the top of my list of coming in, you know, to the race with what we've seen so far. Yeah, he's yeah, definitely showing he's in good shape. And even before his win too, he he was riding really strongly too in tour of the Basque Country. So I think he's he's shown that he's got consistently good form coming into this race and, and I, I didn't read the whole article but I saw where they were saying he's much more mature now, he's had more experience, he knows how to handle the pressure of being a leader in, in a grand tour or so yeah. and yeah. he did win the the Vuelta of España, so he has won a grand tour before yes it wasn't yeah. just him faltering in that that um giro a few years ago so uh, and then that take, brings us to the jai henley um question with team dsm were will he be able to repeat or do close to what he did last year which i'd be surprised because there's so many other top riders but Maybe not. I don't, I don't know. I mean, well, they also have Bardet on the team. Yeah, too, Roman Bardet. Is, <laughs> right. He's been riding, been riding really well Tour too. Tour de so. podium racer. Yeah. yeah. So that that'll be interesting. Um, he has good support, and Chris Hamilton. He's he's a strong rider too. Um, another Australian for Team DSM. Um, Team Quebec at ASOS. As we go round out the rest of them, Dominique 
Yeah, Domenico Pozzovivo yeah. seems to always be up there, but he's a yeah. guy I would see maybe maybe getting in the top ten, but not not much. Yeah, higher. I see him on, on the mountain stages. You expect him to be a, a big player, but yeah, he's I mean, he's you know got to be like what five two or something like that. He's pretty he's one of the shortest guys in the in the peloton for sure, and and so not going to be as good of a time trialer. And and but yeah, he's someone who's active for sure. I guess think they're probably hoping that Nizzolo can get. Uh, a couple wins, wins and, yeah, yeah, and sprints too. So they're, you know, they, they're, and they're, they're without. I think they're without a world tour win so far, aren't they? This year, or maybe just one. Yeah, I can't recall any right now. No, yeah, yeah. they have Victor Campanerts for the for the um, time trial too. Yeah, so he's, yeah. he's really strong in the in the against the clock. Um, Truck Segafredo, we mentioned Vincenzo Nibali coming into the race with a broken wrist. Hand, yeah. Wrist, so he's always going to be a question mark. Someone that. Will could ride strongly, but you know they have Ciccone, Julio Ciccone, and yeah. Balcomola Balcom too. So yeah. three strong overall riders, but question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like we were talking about again before we were on the air about Lester and Lombardia. They all three of those guys were in the sixth person break, and they finished fourth, fifth, and sixth at yeah. the end of the race too. So. I can see definitely this being one of those kind of situations where they have guys up in the top ten, but do they have somebody that can get on the podium? Uh, maybe, but you know, would not be surprised if they don't either. Right, right. But somebody's going to have to be on the podium. I, I just, yes, I don't know. I mean, I, I would say Simon Yates, you know, as a lock of anyone of a podium spot, if not winning, but. After that, I think there's so many question marks. And then yeah. Team UAE Emirates, they, they were going to send Brandon McNulty back to improve on his 15th overall finish last year, which was the best American Grand Tour debut finish since like the early 2000s. But he rode so well at the um, yeah. Tour of the Basque and the spring that looks like he's going to head to the Tour de France and be in support of Teddy Pogaccio, which in a way it was really great because it would be like Matteo Jorgensen, another young American rider who won't have the pressure of being a GC rider where every day you're going to have to be attentive and, and waste a lot of mental energy and that to stay up front where he'll be able to um, have days off, so to say, so to speak, and then learn a lot and support um, Daddy Pogaccia in his defense, which he's going to need extra firepower um, this year as he's have more of a target on his back for sure. Yeah, they'll expect you know UAE Emirates to do more work than they did last year. Last year they kind of hid in the shadows and weren't expected to control the field much at all because you know Jumbo Visma was kind of dominating the race up to the very end. But this year definitely they're going to look to them to be a team that exerts authority on the front of the race too. And so McNulty's going to be somebody who they're going to count on to do that oh, some days. Yeah, he's just great time he's time trials too. He's more like a Rohan Dennis in a way where he can time trial really well and climbs well because of his ability to pure, yeah, yeah, it's just just suffer. Pure strength, like, yeah. yeah, he's just really yeah. strong. So, yeah. um, UAE, though, the sending Davide Formolo, who he's won a stage at the at the um, Giro before, and he was <laughs> racing really well at Lea's Best on Lea, so be interesting yeah. to see how he does in three weeks. And Joe Dombrowski, who some years ago was in a lot of breaks in the high mountains, and you thought, well, hey, he's going to get a stage win one of these times, and he never did. So it would be really cool if he would be uh, turn back the years to the, those days and have a chance for for an overall place. But if he's supporting David and Formula, maybe he won't, won't get that chance. Yeah, Joe Dombrowski's racing pretty well too, so he might – you know, maybe one of situations where he goes ahead in a break on a mountain stage, and then if he's not needed to come back to support Formula, then he can go for a win himself. So I think that might happen. But they also have uh, Dario Ulissi too, which is you know he, Diego Ulissi. Yeah. Oh, Diego, sorry, Diego Ulissi. He's um, I think he's actually won a couple stages of the yeah. Giro in the past. Too, I so. think I've got a picture of him winning a stage one year when I went near Venice and saw a stage finish. Yeah, and then they have Gaviria, who's yeah, not Gaviria, going yeah, to be not... sprinting very well this year, but but he's got a great lead out, man, one of the best, yeah. Richese, Maximilo Richese. So, yeah, let's see, let's see if he comes into form yet or not. He might, he's the kind of guy that could become into form and, and catch a fire and do really well, or just keep being back half of the top ten. So let's see. Yeah, yeah, it's so a lot of question marks, a lot, a lot of question marks, but uh, it's going to be a fantastic race for sure, as the Giro usually is. And then we've got circled on the calendar the the Strada Bianchi stage, the 
white road stage, which I was I was thinking about. Like, okay, of these contenders, of the people we see for the overall, who do you think would fare well in that kind of stage where you could possibly lose a race? You're not going to win it. It's one of those stages where you could um, not do well, though, and, and really dig a hole for yourself for the overall. And then I was trying to think, well, which of these contenders – did Strada Bianchi this year and, and does well on that kind of um, terrain. Yeah, I mean, you know, we actually didn't see Nidalee ride really well on that kind of stuff too, so he's the kind of guy you might expect. But Bardet has raced fantastic in the past on Strada Bianchi. He was a podium finisher one year, uh, three years back, I think. So, um, yeah, it would be interesting to see. I think sometimes we get people that we don't think of as being a particularly good gravel rider, but then they rise to the occasion in, in these races – which means they probably could do better in other races as well, too, but it's just not their focus. You know? Right. Well, that's going to be... Oh, let's see. I had what stage it was. How early is it? Not on your birthday. I was checking what's on your birthday. <laughs> I remember it was. I posted a picture on my Facebook page the other day yeah. in 2010 that I was there to watch the Giro stage where Cadell Evans won is the Strada Bianchi stage. Ah, right here it is. It's uh, stage 11, Wednesday, May 19th. Perugia to Montalcino. I think that's it. All right. All right. So early on, I mean, we've got a prologue, a nine-kilometer time trial to start out. So we'll kind of get an idea of some form right away from that, which is, you know, nine kilometers is a decent for prologue i mean it's almost like what 10 is the kind of cutoff where you start calling it a time trial instead of a prologue or i, I want to say it's less than that it's eight point i want to say it's eight point something it is it says oh, like yeah. TT, it's, not prologue so yeah be, so, yeah so you're right at the edge of just becoming a, t, yeah. a time trial yeah so and then uh, i've got some flatterish stages you know not not any big mountains not any climbing because some of the giros in the recent past have had big mountain stages within a couple like stage yeah. three or stage four so we're not right. going to see the first big uh climbing day really until stage uh, six, stage, right. stage six and yeah. then stage nine is showing a, a like a mountain top finish uh, okay because stage nine is not a particularly mountain stage i don't think but it might have a finish of it it does it has an uphill finish so uh, that usually always causes some separation especially yeah. for the overall when you finish uphill because Anything other than an uphill finish, you can, you know, if you can stay in a group, it's hard, hard to get away. But not always necessarily, like we see, saw, like in, um, even in Romania or the Tour of Basque Country. Yeah, I think that there's was, there's was not a ton of sprint stages. It looks like you know two, five, thirteen, and twenty one. So you know a few scattered throughout the race. So having stage thirteen and twenty one, you know, tries to keep the sprinters around for a little bit longer, maybe than than what they would otherwise. But most of the mountain stages are going to be packed into the last week, which is very typical of the Giro as well, too. And then it looks like mostly flatter uh, intermediate stages in the first week and a half yeah, or so. Yeah, but, but the Thursday, May 13th, does show an uphill finish as well. And that's, that's stage six. Yeah. It gets yeah. a mountain designation, yeah. Yeah. No. So I think I was, when you're talking about the sprint stages, not so many and not any really in the last week, I was reading about Tim Merlier for uh, Alpes and Phoenix, who might possibly leave the Giro after the, you know, the, most of the sprint stages, so he can recover in time to race at the Tour as well. Since they're, you know yeah, Alpes so, and Phoenix, they don't have as big a team, not being a World Tour team, and and doing the chance to race in the Tour and have um, Matteo Vanderpool racing there, they'll want to have their best of the best for their team then. Yeah, I Miller's mean, definitely had a really good season too. So he's he's you know going to want to show himself if he can in the Giro, but then right prepare for the Tour. So the question is, will he stay around till stage thirteen um, or not? Because otherwise, there's just two chances. Said he probably would stay to thirteen. Yeah, is what I read. Makes, yeah, it would make sense. Yeah, because after that, it's a lot of mountain stages. Yeah, and so and then and then the final stage is flatter, but twenty one, but it's a time trial, so it's it's not like he gets a chance to win at the end. You know, maybe stage eighteen might have a, a finish he could be there for but yeah might, there might not be any sprint stages until you know after 13 so so the the time trials are the first and the last then right yeah yep and it's uh, the last one's a 30.3k so it's it's a pretty long time trial too um you know we don't have like you used to it used to be 
back in the day, they had like you know hour and a half, hour and fifty minute time trials and some way back tours. in the day. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know what our exact so. our age of our listeners are, but I said probably suspect more of them are do remember those days if they're following cycling then. But yeah, it's it's been a long time since they had those hugely long time trials. Yeah, so now you get a 30k one and, and it's considered a long one. But back back then it would be you know oh that's just a really short one. But yeah, that's a significant one at the end. I mean, definitely it's you know it could make a big difference. I mean, in the '89 tour, you know there was a very short time trial that made the difference between Lamond and Finn Young winning. So it can be a short one making a big difference. But a 30k one, you know, you could have people losing you know a minute or more if you're in the GC hunt. So. Um, it, it leaves some drama for sure if the race is tight at all towards the end. Yeah, for sure. And, and who do you think of those that we mentioned uh, for the overall besides Simon Yates would would make up time and be strong in that final time trial? Uh, you know, I mean, Bernal certainly would have the chance to do it. So he's he's a he's a pretty decent time trialist. So um, if if he's yeah, very in good. the area, yeah. yeah so. You know, but what about he, someone like Mikhail Landa or Alexander Vlasov? <laughs> I don't know about their time trialing skills. They're not the best for sure. No. Yeah, Bardet's not all that great either. No. Um, Nibali used to be. So yeah. who knows? If, you know, if he's if he's the kind of guy that can win a time trial still, I think if or you know not losing time if he was potentially right. in the pink. You know, but otherwise he's not going to do so well. Zhao um, Almeida, very good he's, time trial. He's a good time trial. Yeah, yeah. And Remco yeah. Evanpool. Very, very good. Time very good. Yeah. So, yeah. boy, if so. somehow those guys can make it to that last one, you could see see them doing really well and pulling out a, a big win. Yeah, yeah. I have to see. It's it's a uh, yeah. It, a lot a lot will develop. And like I said, last year it ended up people battling out for the pink. We're not yeah, we had no idea. expected to. Yeah. So, you know, you just don't know how the race is going to develop. And that and that does happen sometimes. You know, like you know, I'd say looking at the list of of winners over the last ten years, Ryder Heisendel. I don't think was going in as a favorite no. in 2012. Um, Carapaz probably wasn't a favorite no. in 2019. He just kind of basically, you know, just stayed there and yeah. thereabouts. And yeah, he got in it. And then, him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, Theo Gegenhardt, obviously last year too, we didn't think was. And you know, Jai Hindley was second. So, yeah. 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 So, you know, we don't have, you know, so, I mean, uh, 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 the big names like, you know, Froome or Dumoulin or Nibali or Contador or Quintana <laughs> before that, you know, those, those are the ones you expect to be there, even Scar- Scarponi, you know, in the 2011. But so it's, it's a mix with the, with the, with the Giro for sure. The tour, you have less surprise winners, yeah, I think. I, I the, mean, this year is looking like Pogaccia and, and Roglic have been super strong the string, but then you look at the Ineos guys, uh, Adam Yates and, and, um, Garrett Thomas are being very formidable as well. Yeah, it'd be very surprising to have a surprise winner of the tour. But for the Giro, I think it'd be almost surprising if we didn't have a you know someone who isn't necessarily favored at least on the podium. Yeah, well, that's going to make it you know very exciting. And not you know, that's always what has made these races not exciting. That the Grand Tours has been the Ineos Grenadiers train yeah. at the front, just drilling the pace so no one can attack or do anything, and they control the whole race. And that's to me, for me, has not been very very um, exciting to watch but a more open race with them um, maybe not yeah. that kind of domination you know, they... has won too that was a it was not a typical Ineos win either too so um and, and you know Teo Gigenhardt I would say that was a typical not not a typical Ineos win too <laughs> so they they've when they've when they have won the Giro, well, I think Carapaz been... was racing for not for Star with time yeah yeah he might have been racing for most Star. yeah time. Uh, yeah, he wasn't with with the Neo Sun. Oh yeah, nineteen. Yeah, he was with Mozart still. So yeah, so um, yeah, it, it's just a more open race for sure. It, a lot of people like the Giro as a as a Grand Tour because it's more um, more open, unpredictable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the pan the fans, of course, on the side of the road are very the tof, the tofsi, tofsi, I think they the yes, It's all the tofsi, tofsi, yes. Yeah. Is also passionate about it, and whether we'll get to see as many of the fans on the side of the road or not, you know, we're not sure because Italy's definitely taken a hit again for uh, COVID, but not as bad as a lot of places in Europe have lately. So hopefully there can be some of that excitement on the side of the road, but also to excitement in the races day to day. Yeah, I just um, look at one last time at the list. Ineos has Pavel Sivakov as well, who could be. 
he could end up on the podium. Yeah. He has attributes. So might not, I would, you know, I can, I could pick maybe one of those guys that if they stay healthy from Ineos to be on the podium, Simon Yates, and then maybe even one of the young, um, Dirkin at quick step riders. So that's, that's, that's my choice. I don't know if Mark Solar or Mick Alanda could be up there. Those would be my other, the other two. So if I picked top five, I would say Solar, Landa, um, one of the Ineos, um, Bernal or Sivakov kind of guys, or Shalomita or Evanpool, and then Simon Yates. That's, I'm going to stick my neck out right away and say that. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I think uh, Bardet has been riding really well. Um, I think he might be a surprise and, and be up there. Um, so it'll be interesting. And then maybe even like uh, Bookman for Bor- Boron Zero. It seems like he yeah. stays around the top a lot. And so could be in that top five as or well. Or Balka Molimar or Ciccone. What about them or Nibali? Any of the, from that truck Segafedo trio? I think that all three of those guys have enough tough days that mm-hmm. they'll be there or thereabouts for most of the race. But, but not in the end. Some, something happened that'll knock them out towards the end. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think that the big surprise could be Remco Evanpool. Yeah. But I don't you get, know. Win, if, win by a mile. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I mean he's so strong and so yeah. talented um, that I think that you can't count him out, even not having even though he raced, hadn't raced yeah. for eight months and being what's he's twenty years old now or something. So mm, I don't even know is he twenty yet? You know, there's an eighteen year old that's going to be racing the Giro. Really? Yeah, he's one of the, on the wild card teams. Oh, that's that's very young. Yeah, it's crazy, huh? I'll find his name for next podcast. I won't. I won't look yeah. it up. Evan so. Poole is 21, 21. Oh, he's 21. Okay. Yeah. Ah, his, his story is crazy, too, starting out. I mean, just coming into racing, really, as a 17-year-old after being a soccer player. So, And they kind of talk about his cockiness or his kind of confidence. It comes more from that f- soccer mentality and not coming up like a, as a cyclist for all the time. So, And plus, he's probably won so many times. He doesn't. He's not like all those cyclists that... They've lost, 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 and they finally get a win, and they know how yeah. how how it is to lose so many times. He, he hasn't lost that much. But as a soccer player, though, if he ever falls down, he has to like lay and writhe in pain a lot before he jumps up and is fine. <laughs> yeah, the opposite of cyclists. They're yes. all busted up, and they get right back on the bike, and they go, "Come on, I'm good, come I'm come good." Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, we talked a lot about the Tour of Romandy in our in our talk build up of the of the Giro d'Italia. So I think we hit on most of those stages. Peter Sagan getting getting a win again there. I'd be curious to see well, what he does at the Giro. I mean, they said, oh, something about he's back. He said, what do you mean? I, I've never left. <laughs> so, yeah. What does that mean? So, yeah. Um, and it was a good, it was a good, Roman D was just a good race because yeah. it changed lead a lot. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, especially after the prologue when we thought, ah, oh, Ineos, one, two, three, they're, you're going to do another Catalonia where they totally dominate. And so, and and I don't know. Um, do you feel badly for Garrett Thomas to crash at the finish line? And and not in retrospect that he ended up winning the overall. But I, I like Mike Woods enough that I'm glad he got a chance after racing so strongly recently to get a win. Yeah, yeah. And Garrett Thomas just knows he just totally just kind of lost it there. It wasn't like anything that he did wrong necessarily. It just it was a very cold day, and you couldn't saw feel his hand. Yeah. yeah, all the riders had like full finger gloves on for that that final climb, which normally you'd be warmed up on the climb. It was a miserable day, and yeah, he just you know you do feel I feel bad that he fell for sure. I don't feel bad that he didn't get win get the win, but yeah, I just you know it was embarrassing I think for the fall, but he rode a good strong race, and I think that it was. You know, it's been since 2018 when he won the Tour de France that he's had a win. So I think that this kind of showed that he's, you know, Enos has stuck their neck out a little bit saying he's their leader in July and for the Tour. And and they, you know, put uh, Bernal in the in the Giro to, you know, which who could easily be the leader for the, t- the Tour. And so they kind of put the pressure on Garrett Thomas to be stepping up again to show he could win another Tour. And so this is kind of like confirmation of that, that he's on the right track. He's He's riding super strongly, and so I think you know it was just good to see that that he's going to put himself in that position again. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, let's touch on just uh, around the rest of the races going on in Europe. Um, I think we're American fans, so we're looking at the different results, and we see 
um, two races where Americans on the podium, but uh, the race um, that's starting tomorrow, the Volta Algarve, Algarve in southern Portugal, which usually is a February uh, race where it's colder and rainy. My friend Thomas, the doctor for Azure Citroen, is happy to go there in May and have sunny, nice yeah. warm weather for a change. But uh, a race that took place in Portugal before this race where both American squad rally cycling will be and Hagen's Berman action. And the Hagen's yeah. Berman action, Sean Quinn got a win at a one-day race. Um, it was the Classica da Arabida. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah a win. Win by American. up at the end, too. He, yeah. he won you know, by 11 seconds, too. So it must have been a tough parkour. Yeah, so that would be fun to, to follow both rally and and um, Hagen's Berman action in, in the race in Portugal. So that's – and a uh, win for American in Europe. That's That doesn't happen too often. No. So look at, at the at the course. It just looks a little lumpy at the end, a couple – Couple climbs with a with a, a little bit of a uh, uphill finish. So, yeah, it was you know he won by 11 seconds and 13. Two guys were together. Then 16 was a group. So it must have been just that really attacking style racing at the end. And and he was obviously the strongest person. So that's it's quite the quite the win to get over there. You know it's a it's a, a 1.2 race, so not the highest rank, but still. You know, yeah, we're, it's it's a it's a good there. win. Yeah, Sean Quinn. So we'll um, follow him as he progresses in his career. But that's. A nice step up for him. And then in the Tour de Rwanda, which has been in different parts of the calendar, it used to be around November thanksgiving this time, and, and now it's taking place in May. And on the first stage, Al Cohn from Wildlife Generation Pro Cycling, American team, American-based team, he was second to um, Team Midland's Brian Sanchez, who has roots of racing in the United States back around the domestic circus some years ago, raced for the Hinkapi team. So he got the first stage win and he got another third place i guess there's time bonuses at which he's still leading the overall after three stages there yeah and i I keep seeing more and more about the rwanda apparently they are bidding for a uci world championship right right racing so so they're trying to show that they're have the capability of putting on that bigger kind of race and i guess there's never been any video that's come out of of the tour of rwanda but this year they do have some highlights that are being shown and they you know, oh, they get fans that line the road. I'm sure they're not social yeah. distancing or anywhere. You probably have more fans watching that race now than any race has been attended by fans in the last year. Yeah, Pierre Roland is there, and I guess he was showing some when he was out just riding. You know, not in the race, but just riding. He filmed the fans running next to him, these kids and stuff too, just you know, on the side oh. of the road, lining the road and trying to run alongside him. And so I, yeah, I it's, saw it's just, another video of this. Young guy riding one of those sturdy bikes for transportation and keeping up with these guys on <laughs> the fast <laughs> race bike and yeah so no it's it's got to be quite an experience and an exciting time and Israel Start Nation has some riders there they're they're there as well as James Pickley who also raced in the U.S. got uh, third place in the third stage yeah yep yeah and there's a, a few a few you know bigger teams like B&B Hotels is there too and. Androni. Yeah, uh, they got the last two, so, uh, stage two and three, both won by Alan Bolio. Yeah, so it's a mix for sure. And then the wildlife generation, um, you know, I, I, Johnny Clark's not over there. He was racing with me this weekend while well, racing the same race. He was doing the one-two pro race, but I was doing the masters. But um, wildlife is continuing to be present all over the world, which, you know, you, again, give credit to Denny Van Hout for finding a way to get his team to <laughs> all those different races all over the world. Yeah, for sure. And oh, you know, going back to the race in Portugal, it was interesting to see the rally squad is uh, all Americans racing in that race. Oh, the whole well. lineup of U.S. riders. So, rally does have a couple uh, uh, Canadians, but they also picked up the uh, Dutch rider who won the first stage of the Tour of Turkey. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And they actually too had a couple of French riders that were riding on. Um, yeah, when they couldn't get everybody short, over. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Short term contracts right. too. So. Again, they're doing what it takes to do as well, too. But they've got a base over there in, in I think, in Spain, Girona. right? Yeah. In Girona, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And they, I think, you know, they had an express goal of getting a World Tour license at some point in time, too. So, um, And they've got a couple of former World Tour racers now on the team. So they, they still need to make, make another step up, I think, in terms of the racing. But they're trying to do what they can to establish themselves as a, a team that can compete at that level. Sure. Sure. Well, the, we had a women's, um, it was called the Cycling Festival, Elsie Jacobs, 
Um, Lorena Weavers, she took the overall win for Team DSM with Leah Kirshen. Um, they were second on the podium for the overall. Well, they were both in the in the prologue. That was their placings there, so they held on to that. Um, but there was a race that was took place in in the Netherlands, I guess. Yeah, but Emma Norsgaard. I'm sorry, Emma Norsgaard ended up winning the overall. Now Lorena Weavers won the prologue. It was Emma Norsgaard from Movie Star and the Lady Kirschman then finishing second, second overall. Yeah, Ruth race. Winder was seventh in that race too. And that was a lot. Of, she had, Ruth Winder had a really good prologue too, so I think that helped her out for sure there. Yeah, and the shifting, the racing now in Spain, they're going to start uh, the Centima Classic race. It usually is earlier in the year, Centimana Ciclista Valdiano Vuelta Comunicad Valencia. That's um, taking place this week, and they've got some more racing in Spain going on the rest of this month. Yeah, around the world, there's been a number of races that have shifted you know, from those early season ones to the summertime. So we're going to see some of the normal schedule plus some races that we would normally have seen earlier in the year this year because COVID's still out there and affecting a lot of things. We're hoping that there's not many more cancellations or alterations in courses from this point on, but there are definitely hot spots still that are having to do lockdowns and affect the racing. But they've proven that most of the time they can hold these races pretty safely. For sure. And then uh, the other note I have here to talk a little bit about Nairo Quintana winning the Vuelta Asturias uh, race. So he's racing well again. He raced well last year, racing for Team Arkea Samsic, and his focus will be then in the the Tour de France later this summer. He's going to do the Dauphiné and then the Tour. But, um, yeah, he won the Vuelta Asturias race. And Pierre Latour, who races for Team Total Direct Energy, now got a stage win there on stage three. Yeah, uh, yeah. Quintana last year started out just on fire and was racing so well at the beginning of the year, and then having COVID hit really disrupted his ability to be able to take advantage of that form that he hasn't seen for a lot of years. So this year he started out slower for sure, and he's starting to hit his stride a little bit more now. Should be in hopes that he can. Yeah, you know, I think he, he still feels like he could be a, a, a tour a tour podium contender, and. Uh, you know, I mean, he's, 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 I, I look and see what hold he is, but I think he's like 31. He's not, yeah, 31, 31 years old. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so he's, he's certainly in that age where he can still do it. And, um, yeah, I think that when he wins a race like that and he, and he won not in a mountaintop finish, too. He won, actually, it was a, 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 a hilltop finish and then, a hilltop and then downhill to the finish. And he had enough of a lead to be able to hold off the, the pack on that first stage and then held on to his lead because he won by enough that first stage to hold his lead for the whole three days. Yeah, I think he's shows that he he could still do it, and I think a lot of people are, are rooting for him too to to do well because he did well when he was so young, and then hasn't followed up with it quite as much as I think that he people think he could. So yeah, it'd be yeah he won some grand well. tours. He just never won the Tour de France, so that that's really yeah, and really... younger in his career too. So yeah, yeah. So, yeah. All right, and it, it, it is podium on the tour too. So it wasn't yeah. like he's yeah yeah it was. Finishing behind someone named Chris Froome, who was <laughs> seemingly unbeatable in those days with his um, Sky team then controlling the race. Well, let's, let's look at this birthday list. We kind of have a pretty big birthday list to cover today. You, did you have anything else before we wrap up with the birthdays? I don't think so. I was trying to think if I, 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 I've been doing uh, some talks for some groups, and I was trying to think if I'd seen anything special from anybody else, but I don't, I don't think so. All right, there is, you know you touched a little bit of racing in the U.S. The racing in northern Georgia, and um, more races going around around the country. So, but that's going to get bigger as the the USA Crit Series um, starts up, and really in June it really kind of kicks off, where we have the more races that we'll probably talk about then. But um, let's go. Yeah, I, got uh, to, I got to ride with your son Taylor yeah. last Thursday. Oh yeah, last you got Thursday, to go. So. Yeah, you're doing a training camp. Yeah, I just caught the end of the camp. A lot of the guys were already gone, but um, yeah, did yeah, he have great. his new Ventum bike? Yes. Yeah. So I didn't get all the details on that, but apparently Candale just said they couldn't get the team bicycles this year, or at least not for quite a while yet, too. And then they had like, because of the su- supply shortage. Yeah. 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 Every, everything they could yeah. make right now is is backordered from paying customers, and so to sponsor a team with with the bikes was hard for the for the company to do. So. Yeah, so they had a, a, a connection with Ventum, and um, apparently they're out of Salt Lake City, 
and uh, you know it's it's a brand that mostly was into triathlon before this, and so they're not really well known in the road group, but they look like a, a real solid. Disc yeah, bike it looked, with looked the, really nice. Yeah, with the cables all the you know the hydraulic disc brake cables hidden within the stem and, and stuff too. So a very clean looking, yeah, good looking bike for sure. Wow, they're very nice. Well, they yeah, they I think they had a good camp, uh, did a little racing. They're part of the Hincapie series, and so yeah, they'll be gearing up for June racing in June too. Like I said, June is really going to be the big kickoff month for the racing, bigger races in the United States. Yeah, unfortunately, the the, the road nationals are going to be one of the first things that really are on the yeah. calendar in the third week of June. So, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll be Taylor was trying to decide how he wanted to work that because there's a couple of the bigger races around the country happening too. Whether he was going to go to nationals or not for the road race because it's a, such a hard course and there's very few people that finish the road race course every year too so um you know it's you gotta decide whether it's worth it or not to go sure all right well luis herrera wow one of yeah. the pioneering colombian riders celebrating his 60th birthday today luis herrera won the uh, the criterium de dauphine twice he won the overall of the vuelta España. i mean you oh, would have thought that he would have you know been a guy that would have could have won been the first Colombian to win the tour, but uh, he won yeah. three stages there. Uh, he won three stages at the Giro. He was twice the polka dot holder yeah. of at the tour. So yeah, he won Alpe d'Huez before. He's won. Yeah, he was clearly one of the best climbers, and he rode actually a, a pretty large frame by today's standards. So if you look at old pictures of him on the bike, it makes it, him look really small, huh? Yeah, yeah. So he's one point six nine meters, which I'm not sure. How small it is, but it's just unusual to see pictures of him on a, on a bike frame that seems much bigger than what he would have had to have ridden at this point in time. But yeah, he was a classy, classy rider and such a good time trialist too. So five um, foot just, five, five foot five. Okay, yeah. an impressive guy. So all right, well, uh, Megan Garnet, one of the best ever female cyclists coming from the USA. Yeah. She she has a big Paul Mary's list too. Yeah, she was here at the Bookwater Binge a couple of years ago, and I got my picture taken with her and talked to her a little bit, too, and rode with her a little bit, too. So she's a super nice person, too. But, yeah, a Giro Rosa winner and, yeah. Super. Amgen Tour California winner, Philadelphia International Cycling Classic, so she could win one-day races as well. Overall, the Tour of Norway, Tour of Yorkshire. So, yeah, super um, strong rider and, and great all-around celebrating her 36th birthday. She's 1.63 meters, so she's not much sh shorter than Lu Luis yeah, Herrera. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And yeah. we skipped over Alexander Kolobnev. He's turning 40 today. Yeah. So um, tw he's like the forever second man, it looks like. Twice <laughs> second in the World Championship, second in Liège, best on Liège, second twice in the Grand Prix Miguel Indrain, second in the Giro de Amelia. So, yeah, he raced uh, Team Katusha several years, but before that, CSC, he was with CSC Rabobank early on. So, yeah, strong Russian rider. Turning 40 today, a um, couple of the current women racing. Soraya Paladin, the Italian, she's uh, a very strong racer um, coming out of Italy. She races for um, Live Racing now. She won in 2019 the Giro della Marcia in Rosa, the overall there. Yeah, Hannah Barnes, too, right after that, too. She's 28 years old, and she's had some decent racing results recently, but not a win yet, because I was saying Canyon Sram has not won a race yet this year. And uh, But she's she's been riding strongly. I haven't seen her name up there a lot so far this year. Yeah, and Simone Patilli, another... Um, Current racer racing for Intermarché Wante Gobert um, material. She is also 28 today, Italian racer. There's a lot of Italian women birthdays today. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let's see. I didn't look further down if there are any other U.S. Yeah. Uh, riders celebrating their birthday of note. Let's see. I need to get no? a quick look here, too. Yeah. All right. Well, a lot of big names at the top, so... Celebrating their birthday on the May the Fourth. Be with you today. I see Jaime yeah. Polinetti. So, Jamie Jamie, Jamie. Polinetti. Oh, Jaime! <laughs> I give him a, a Spanish <laughs> name. Jamie, so Jamie Polinetti was a really good racer, and he actually was the first pro leader for LA Sheriff. So when I when I first turned elite racer, 
I considered L.A. Sheriffs and Belavante and ended up going with Belavante. And the next year, uh, L.A. Sheriffs went to pro, and they hired Jamie Polinetti to be the team leader at that point. He was um, in his 30s at that point because he's 57, so he's just two years younger than I am. So he was already, I think, right around 30, 31, something like that too. So a more experienced rider though, but he was kind of like the leader of L.A. Sheriffs because he had the most experience on a brand-new pro t- team at that point. And so he was very instrumental in early U.S. pro racing. And tell me my computer's not listening to me because on my Pro Cycling Stats website, I have an ad in the front for Ventum. Performance-focused gravel road and triathlon <laughs> bikes direct to you. Wow. A picture of a guy on a gravel bike. So, yeah. All right. Well, Ray, it's um, always a pleasure to talk to you about all the cycling, a lot of racing going on, and we're excited about the Giro d'Italia coming up and all the question marks, you know. It would be probably not until the third week till we get answers to those, but it's going to be a fun, exciting race to follow for sure, and we'll uh, keep up with that, what else is going on. And you know, How many other podcasts talk about the Tour of Rwanda and one-day races in Portugal? I don't know, but there's, we're just glad you listened to us, what we have to say and what we um, bring. I do, I, bring I do in. see one more, one more birthday we have to mention. Oh, though. yeah? Greta, 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 yep, Greta Namanis. Oh, uh, really? A former triple Xer. Yeah. She's 30, 33 years old today. She was a Paralympic world, cha- world champion, world champion, as well as a Olympic medalist. Um, so she's and she raced as a pro racer for twenty twenty. Oh, there uh, she is, Greta. So yeah. twenty sixteen. Yeah. So Greta came out of the triple X racing Athletico program in Chicago, and uh, retired sadly because she had a, a concussion that she had a really hard time getting over. So. But she was one of the first para athletes who raced on an able bodied pro team in wow. 2016. So All she right. was. Happy yeah. birthday, Greta. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, good spotting that. Would not yeah. want to miss that one. It's also St- St- Stephen Kincaid, too. I remember that's a name that sounds familiar, too. He's 49. I must have raced against him when he was. Mm-hmm. When he was, he younger, was 13th so. in the Saturn Rochester Twilight Criterium in 2007, racing for Rite Aid Pro Cycling. Yeah, continental team. Yeah. But Greta, though, I, I would want, I would want, wouldn't want to miss. No, uh, Greta's, no. Yeah, Happy so. birthday, Greta. So, all right. Well, thanks again, Randy. Um, we'll come back again, maybe on your birthday, maybe not. But if not, if we come after your birthday, we'll make sure we, we wish Randy a happy birthday on May twelfth. <laughs> thanks, Dean. All right. Thanks, Randy. Bye now. Bye.